Baron Obi Trinity Committee. I'm Phil Brightmore, I'm the chair, and I'll be making sure this meeting moves to order and all the kind of right things to talk about. Um, before I begin, I just want to mention that last meeting, not everyone used the mics, and I'd be grateful if you can kind of use the mics uh, when you want to speak, and also that we don't speak over each other as there is someone taking notes for Louise and you can't make out what we're saying when we speak over each other. With that said, is there any apologies? Chair, yeah, through you, uh, the section 19 report, it was, it was, um, uh, well, I did report back that the section 19 report was a serious investigation report into a serious flooding incident. And in the report itself, it did not make reference to every property in individual detail. Um, and that, that was commented back. And I did, I did take that back, that the report is now published, but I can assure Councillor Muspratt those properties that you refer to there are included within the action plan uh, in terms of that section 19 report. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Chris, we need to use the mic so that the members who are hard to hear and can make, make out what's going on. Yes, right. Sorry, do I need to use the mic? Do you want to use the real mic? It's on. Right. Right, that's fine. Okay. Also, on page 7, um, the Screening Workshop Programme Report, it says the um, committee decided to give their leading powers to chair vice chair and spokesman persons to meet that consideration. We actually had um, a full committee meeting to discuss this, and those recommendations have come back in this report. Um, so that's not quite accurate. Right, so I'll just go through the Said, I see no prayers. Okay, I mean, a general item three word for on the workshop feedback. My suggestion is that we take that in a general item now, which is the usual um, word program element, as we're going to be discussing pretty much exactly the same. Is that okay for everyone? Yeah. Good, okay. Um, Transform World Community Safety Workshop are in Agenda Item 4, pages 9 to 16. This isn't really to discuss this again. This is just to check over that if you've got any comments you can make them and then the report is limited and passed on to uh, the appropriate uh, camera member and officers. So if anyone has any comments to make, please do so. Children. So just intrigued that it never went near the safety 
and also to say that this is really to give feed, um, to give kind of information on the way in which they're coming to decisions that they're coming to. It doesn't provide feedback and consultation as that's when we just ended. So they have more time to compile that information. That information will come out to compile. Okay? Also we have a call on this. So it's not my intention to reopen that call. We've already had discussions about all of this. It's for noting. But if you have questions, you can ask those questions. With that said, I'll invite um, Colby on Vancouver.
serve 1.5 million residents, etc., etc. The overall recycling rate for Merseyside is 42% last year. Okay, that's an average. The worst performing councils are just under 30%. The best performing councils are around 44%. So you're up there, you're not far off the top of the tree at the moment. So we operate things like, and you'll see these facilities for yourselves, but so don't need to tell you. Our best performing household waste recycling centres happens to be heightened on this picture. There's 85% of everything that comes through the door is either reused or recycled. The average is about 72% across the sites, across all 14. So they used to be called tips, and we used to dump things there. Most of the stuff that goes in there now is recycled. The vast majority of it. Very little of it goes to land for <coughs> consideration. Many of you may have passed this on the East Lakes Road, going out towards St Helens, out to Liverpool. This looks like a swimming pool or a leisure centre, but is in fact a recycling facility <coughs> where your commingled recycler wastes go to be sorted, baled, and sold into the reprocessing markets. Okay. So we get some money back through the contract that we lent to the earlier to run these facilities for us. So you can see the bales behind this has to be a group of children who have been on an educational visit. You can see the kind of thing that's bailed and sold back to the markets for reuse through the sorting of the coping will be something. That's quite a lot of material goes to that facility, about 85,000 tons a year of recycling. This is a picture of the currently in commissioning the rail loading station at Kirby. What's going to happen is the, we used to use big landfill sites to deal with the stuff that hadn't been recycled, which in your case I think was in the as you agree with it. Yeah, um, unless it's changed. What happens to the stuff that isn't recycled? And there's an awful lot of stuff that isn't recycled. But if you think 42% recycling, that means even my maths can work out that's 58%. That isn't recycled. What happens to that? It's going to go on a train. This is a train just on the in the middle of the diagram. There's a sort of curve in the, in the line. That's actually a train going into the building. That building will load trains, load waste into steel containers, closed containers, and they will travel up to an energy from waste plant in the northeast, which is the solution that's been procured for Merseyside's residual waste or non recycled waste. <coughs> that's inside that building. It's pretty big. Uh, each of those grabs can grab seven tons at a time. So you can get the scale, the scale of this thing. We're not talking small. That's the energy from waste facility being built, and that's it now. It's currently commissioning and will start at the end of October or maybe early November, depending on how commissioning pans out. That has been procured and bought on your behalf, along with all the other councils. It is a £250 million investment by Merseyside in an energy recovery facility. That is a combined heat and power plant powering other businesses on that industrial estate. Well, using the heat. So it's connected to a steam network. And you can see the sort of scale of it. Here's the train on the left and, and the dolly that takes the super container off the line, onto the dolly and into the facility. Um, there will be two trains a day. Uh, and that will be six days a week. And that's for the stuff that hasn't been recycled. Again, that starts in October, November this year in, in full capacity. Some of the other things we do, which again you're probably aware of, is obviously we're into trying to help people reuse materials, whether that be cookers, fridges, furniture, bric a brac, bicycles. We give some money to community groups and, and voluntary organisations and social enterprises, including on the world. Um, to educate people about how to reuse
just come back up from the low point past uh, last year, 2014. But how do you compare it to other councils on Merseyside? Actually, do quite well. Um, some have changed systems, some are in the throes of changing systems. Um, Woodham's always been a relatively good performer, but it's fallen back slightly in the last few years. <coughs> So how does the totality of Woodhull's waste look? Well, actually, the big red bar across the top is the stuff that isn't recycled or composted. It's quite a big, that's a big amount of waste. Um, so you've still got some room to go. What we're interested in is the very top line. Are your waste arisings going down? Because the more waste you produce, the more I charge you for disposing of it, particularly if it's not recycled. So, waste prevention, reuse of materials, keeping it out of your production system altogether is probably the most cost effective thing to do, but that's obviously difficult. Um, if you have a collection system, the efficiency of that system in getting to where you want to get to at each cost is critical um, because residual waste costs more than recycling.
percent of your residual waste was potentially recyclable. Again, that's what I'm saying about some of the valuable materials you actually want to recycle are in the wrong bin. Five and a half percent was potentially reusable by somebody, mostly textiles and weed, which is waste electronic and electrical equipment. Okay? People throw things away and still actually work. And as soon as they go in the residual bin, they're either being going in a hole in the ground or they'll be burned for energy. When somebody could have used that material, could have used that toaster, kettle, whatever it might be. Yeah? So it's not a big number and it's very difficult to get it out. But the promotion of reuse charities, voluntary organisations, social enterprises can help you reduce the amount of that stuff getting in the residual bin. And about 7.5% of 2,000 tonnes of your commingled bin was non-target material. So, and the problem with that is it contaminates the good material. It either contaminates it because it's a dirty nappy, it's contaminating perfectly good aluminium cans or whatever it might be that you can sell, or it's contaminating it because it's a lower grade material that the market doesn't want. And a very good example of that is yogurt pots and plastic tubs and trays. People have always asked us, and it's a perfectly legitimate question, why can't we recycle yogurt pots and plastic tubs and trays? Well, the answer is you can recycle them, but you can't sell them. And if you put them in with the good plastics, like milk bottles, what happens is you get a lower price for your milk bottles, because now it's got plastic tubs and trays in it as well. And so it devalues the other plastic that you <coughs> can to recycle and you can sell to your meat processors. Because one of the problems with uh, recycling is often councillors and others, we all work on tonnage, we all work on weight, weight based targets. The problem with that is that's not a market driven approach to recycling, that's just a weight based approach to recycling. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, the government a few years ago dropped the national indicator for recycling, it's not no longer a statutory indicator. And that recognised in a way that local authorities need to make their own decisions about what's appropriate for their market and what's appropriate for their community. How can you increase your recycling rates? And this is purely an illustration and a construct based on those numbers coming out of composition analysis. Your starting point is 36.4% last year. That's 41,000 tonnes recycled out of a total of about 113,000 tonnes. If you were to capture half of, half of the good recyclers that are in the wrong bin, that's another 7,000 tonnes, that's another 6% on your recycling rate. If you collect food waste and you manage to pick up half of the food waste that's out there, and this is just for the sake of a, a calculation, 50% of it could be my guess, we think that will add another 8% and pick it to 50% recycling. There are lots of issues, and I know you're grappling with them, not least cost. But the first of those two is relatively, relatively low cost to try to, and it's about behavioural change, it's about educating the people to understand what can recycle, what goes in what bin. The right waste in the right bin can actually be very cost effective for you as a council. Can, can I just ask you, if I mind, is brown, the brown bin, do you regrade them? Well, I've got it, that your grey bin is your dry recycling. Yeah. Yeah. Your brown bin is your green waste. Yeah. And your green bin is your residual waste. Yeah. Is that right? right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I Sorry. see. When it's you say recyclables in green bin, you mean what could go in the brown bin? Sorry, the grey bin. It should be the grey bin. I should think you're right. Yeah, you're quite right. It should be. The, it's me getting mixed up. It's the grey bin that should be going into the brown bin. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It's easier than me trying to say recycle bin or coming bin because we've got one coming bin. But of course, every council on this side has got different coloured bins. So you're going to get colour when it comes to who's got bins of what colour. Uh, sorry, it should be from the green bin into the grey bin. But the reason I was just thinking, does that mean now we can put food waste like the back end of our cabbages into the brown bin which we can't put? No. That's a simple answer to that. No. <laughs> We go into that thing all night. So there's just a couple of ideas around, you know, what is it, what sort of um, size of the prize do we get for any, any decisions we make about resourcing some of this stuff. And there are the illustrations, but it gives you a, a good idea of the kind of thing that other councils have done and are thinking about doing. You certainly wouldn't be the first. Um, you're not the worst. Um, certainly you're not the worst on that, that those good materials in the wrong bin. Merseyside, but there is still something to go out there for you as a council. I also look at 
there's a recent report by Brad just come out last week about um, greater consistency. The government is always banging on about more consistency across councils could save councils money. We have got a multitude of different systems, uh, different colour bins, different systems, slightly, slight variations on the theme right across the piece. The three examples that Brad used, and you've got the third of those, co-mingled and separate food, you'll notice all of these ideas that Brad was saying are the best way to proceed, all involve limiting residual waste to some extent. All involve increasing recycling capacity to allow to make it easier for people to recycle, and all involve food. Now that's RAP is the National uh, Waste Recycling Action Program, support, previously supported by the government. It's a standalone thing now, but it's effectively a think tank on recycling. So there you go. That's last week. You know, councils can save money by standardising. Need to think about limiting residual waste, increasing the capacity for recycling, and dealing with food. This is such a big issue. What are the benefits of RAP save? 7% nationally on recycling rates, renewable energy sales, higher quality materials, fewer non target materials, lower costs all around, and obviously reductions in carbon. So there are external benefits, and you will have your own carbon reduction targets to think about as well uh, as an authority. I mentioned some of the things that councillors are interested in is, is you know, where does this waste arise and, and which parts of the world are uh, doing well, which parts maybe we need to look at and think about changing our strategy. Does communications in one part of the world work as well as another? Where, where should we target it? One of the things you need to look at is the split of the socio-economic groups across we're all and across the city region. It won't surprise you to know um, that there is a preponderance of deprived communities in certain parts of the city. If you look at rural, for instance, you've got 206,000 households. You've got relatively few at the very top end in the nicely detached, about 7%. Semis, 20%. Terraces, 41%. And 23 multi occupancies. So, 41 and 23, even my maths, 64. 64% of your population lives in terraces or multi occupancy. Now that changes the communications, the way, <coughs> the way in which you have to design your systems to access those properties. They're not necessarily the easiest properties, they can't always take a multitude of bins and containers. There are lots of issues for you to, to consider. So you've got a different split to the mayor there's a split. It's quite even compared to some parts of the city region actually. It's more even than, than most uh, across the economic classifications, socio-economic classifications. Uh, but a significant, if you look at four and five, the left hand side, either what they call financially challenged or in urban adversity, for me, we deprived. You've still got something like 57, 58,000 households on the world in those lower socioeconomic groups. And again, that, that has to feed into your thinking about the communication strategy and the rollout of any systems that you decide on. Interestingly, the reason that's important is actually the different socioeconomic groups have some different patterns in what they buy what they throw out. Won't surprise you to know that the wine drinking and newspaper reading socioeconomic groups throw out a lot more paper and glass. Um, interestingly, the four and five socioeconomic groups throw out more food. You think, oh, hang on. Surely they're the very people who can't afford to waste money buying food they then throw out. But it actually is true. They spend more on food and they waste more. Um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting dynamic to, to think about. So there is a slight variation, not massive, but a slight variation in who throws what out and who puts what out for recycling. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what about <coughs> who's draining? So what are the two non 
two biggest non-target materials in your bin, rigid plastics and flexible plastics. There are quite a lot, 608,000 tonnes, getting into the great bin. It doesn't, it's not that you can't recycle them, it's just it's not economically viable to recycle them in the current market. That might change. This is, all, this is always a bit of an open door because technology changes, the market price will change. But, but as it stands, rigid and flexible plastics that are not target materials, i.e. non milk bottle type stuff, actually is lowering the price of the good stuff that we can sell. So the messaging around that <coughs> is a difficult one, I know, but it's, it's got to be subtle about what types of plastic you do want to recycle and what types of plastic you don't want to recycle. That could change. We are constantly, I mean, Veolia, for instance, have built a specific plastics recycling plant down in Essex. We call it Perth. Don't ask me. Plastics, something recycling facility. Trying to separate out the different grades of plastic and see if they can sell them. What they've concluded is at the moment there's no market for certain types of plastic. You will get no money for them. Now there are some councils that do this and I found small markets for it. Some of them are carrying the cost of doing it because they believe it's the right thing to do. But that's a political decision you, you would have to go <coughs> the, bigger, the other big one of course is food. Believe it or not, food getting into your recycling bin. And that tends to be pizza boxes with pizza still in it. It's, it's the easiest example to give you. People think they're doing the right thing by recycling the pizza box, but they forgot to take the pizza out of the box in the first place. And that lowers the value of the cardboard up that you can get quite a good price for at the moment. So, quite a few issues. Recycle, recyclables in the wrong bin. 14,000 tons of recycled recyclables in the wrong bin. That's not a small one. Not target materials. Food collections, I know you're grappling with. Dry recycling tends to work best on two weekly basis. Residual. Evidence suggests that you need to start if you if you if you do food, it unlocks all the other things. A lot of these things don't really work unless you're doing food, by the way. So just, re just restricting the size of the res residual bin without taking food out of it will not work. You need to combine the two things together. But restricting the size and the frequency of residual collections helps push people into doing the right behaviour and recycling. Goes hand in hand with food. Smaller bins. Green waste charging, I know you already do. Not a massive issue for the world, but certain parts of the city region certainly is a massive issue. Transient population, students particularly in Liverpool. What are you doing with your RSLs? What kind of services are they providing? Um, and private landlords. Again, that might be a more significant issue for you on the world wide web. Targeting your campaigns, given that you've got a lot of intelligence coming through about different socioeconomic groups and demographics and housing types, you know, the differences between communities. Um, a lot of focus on enforcement, but I'm not a great believer in enforcement for the sake of it. I think we owe it to people to try to communicate better before we start wielding a big stick. It's part of the mix, you need it, it's a deterrent. But I personally, I believe that we are, we are capable of doing a lot better on behavioural change and education. And that for me, enforcement is a last resort. Some of the things we've won. <coughs> Not forgetting, of course, the carbon footprint of waste. And, you know, very pleased to say on the, the left hand side, in 2009, 10, I think that is, it should be, we were, we were net emitters of carbon because we were, were chucking most of the residual waste in the landfill. We are now a non emitter, we're actually saving carbon. Okay, we're reducing carbon from our baseline. So it's a massive turnaround, and that will get even better with the energy from waste. What that is doing is actually converting this stuff into energy. There's still a carbon footprint, but it's a negative number now, it's not positive. We're diverting a lot more waste from landfill, which is hugely polluting and dangerous for the ozone layer. We're avoiding a lot more CO2, and we're saving money at the same time. I know you've been tested in the levy. We have a big argument every year about why is the levy going on. We've managed to use our reserves as an authority to suppress the levy and cushion the levy impact for councils for many years. But I'm afraid to say that money is fast running out. There are very few reserves 
yes, recycling is important, but it's not, it's not everything. There are very much more cost-effective ways, but they're not easy to achieve. You need to sweat your assets and get efficient collection systems. And that might mean working not, it's more difficult for rural because you're geographically isolated. But for some of the other city <coughs> councils, working with each other to share vehicles, share depots, share rounds, whatever it might be, to get more cost effective. You put a lot of assets on the ground and think about it. Vehicles, crews, bins, it's a very it's becoming an expensive service compared to other services as your, as your austerity measures mean that you've got less money available to spend. You want to get the most from your existing systems. Joint working I mentioned, and that might, you know, that might be cross-border working with other authorities. Um, service integration, how do we, you know, a lot of people looking at things like if a council, if a council family is going past some property, can they help with others, promote other services? Yeah. Um, can you integrate with, with other, other services? And this will be something you're looking at. Um, how does it integrate with street cleaning, etc., etc.? Circular economy principles is about promoting reuse of material in simple terms. What are your aspirations in terms of carbon as well as costs? Um, not forgetting there are jobs in the reuse, repair, and remanufacturing sector. A lot of jobs. And a lot of those are being built in the community, voluntary and social enterprise sector, <coughs> of which we should be rightly proud. In fact, the whole city region, um, a lot of other parts of the UK ring us up and ask us, how have we done that? How did Wirral do that? How did Liverpool do that? Because actually, we're doing stuff with the community, the voluntary sector, and the social enterprise sector that is seen as groundbreaking in terms of waste prevention and reuse. Hence, hence we've won some prizes. Chair, sure, thanks very much for, for listening and having to take any questions. All right, thank you, Paul. Uh, so we're here. I'm going to ask the mic to come down this presentation for the rest of the reason being good to have a holistic view of all the evidence in this before we ask those questions. So with that said, Thanks, Chair. Um, we, uh, Mike Coburn, uh, Senior Manager of Waste and Environment, obviously, Royal Council. Um, we, the way we sorted uh, this evening's presentations, sorry it, it's taking time to hear a lot of detail, but well, we should really apologise. It's, it's a big issue for us, it's a big moment for Royal Council um, that we're about to take. You're aware that we've been working on a, a full business case, uh, and we get to the business end of that, of that, of that process, and people will soon be voting cabinet, so we're, we're at a crucial moment. So we thought it would be useful that you get the full context from the disposal authority. Um, our, our very thought-provoking presentation there about the context that we're in nationally um, and regionally. But my, my intention is to respond to that. So this is our, our response to uh, the position that, that, uh, that Carl has painted um, and, and why we need to do it. So um, we can't touch too much on legislation and uh, obviously you know, as, as we've run Brexit and does that change matters for uh, legislation to, to, related to uh, recycling? Well, the answer is we're still obliged to carry it out. There's no change, there's no foreseeable change. Uh, it's enshrined in English law, not just uh, UK or European law, that we need to reach 50% recycling by 2020. And as Carl mentioned, our performance at the moment is around 30%.